Before I get to the scripture, I want to say a word or two about your private, personal Bible study time. I hope you have such a time in your schedule. And I know how busy you are. We all are. But your time with the Bible is so important. And I hope you have a schedule. When you're reading something from the scriptures on a daily basis, and if not a daily experience, at least weekly, you know, you can read a psalm a day. You can read a half chapter in Proverbs. You can read through one of the Gospels. But find something that you can put in a schedule and do your personal Bible study. There is no substitute for it. You can do a lot of other good things. But you cannot make it in the Christian life as God wants you to make it unless you study the scriptures and hide them in your heart. Another good thing to do is memorize some scripture. Uh, I hope you've, you've done that. I think it's safe to say we're all senior adults in here. And by this time, we ought to have scriptures memorized. And if you don't have some memorized, suppose something were to happen and all of our Bibles would be taken away from us. God forbid. But would you have scripture memorized that you can keep in your heart? And you might say, I'm not good at memorization. You'll be surprised at how you can remember when you start memorizing scriptures. It will come to you sort of naturally. The flow will be more than you expect it to be. A couple of Sundays ago, I preached a sermon on scriptures that mean the most to me. And I have memorized those. They're in my heart. They're in my mind. I can quote them at any time. You can do the same. Memorize some scripture. You know, David said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. Well, that's a good way to hide it in your heart. Memorize it. But if you're not going to memorize it, at least read it. And read something in there every day. Every day. If you're real serious about Bible study, there are three books that you need in your library. I want you to write these down. You need a good concordance. And I recommend Strong's Concordance. If you want to look up a verse, if you know one word in the verse, you can find it in Strong's. Get you a good concordance. Now, in the back of most Bibles, there is a concordance, but it's limited. The one I'm telling you about is thicker than this, and it's the best one. So if you want a good concordance, go to the bookstore and get a strong concordance, okay? 
The second book you need to have is a Bible dictionary. You will find that to be so helpful, a Bible dictionary. You can, you can magnify the meaning of Scripture by finding in a dictionary something you've read in a verse of Scripture. For instance, if you were reading something about the temple, Go to your Bible dictionary and look up temple, and it'll give you a whole section talking about the temple and the life of the Jews. Or let's say a city. Let's say you're reading the scripture and you see the city of Bethel. Well, you say, what is Bethel? Where was it? Go to your Bible dictionary and look up Bethel, and it'll tell you about the town of Bethel. That is a good thing to have, a Bible dictionary. And use it. Don't go buy one and put it on the shelf. Use it. A good teacher will always have a Bible dictionary. But it's not just for teachers. It's for all of us. Let's say you were reading something, some verse, and it mentions, just pick out one, Gaza, that we're hearing a lot about right now. Okay? Go to your Bible dictionary and look up Gaza. Oh, the Sea of Galilee. Go to the dictionary and read about that, Sea of Galilee. It's just a good way to increase not only your knowledge of biblical terms, but helps you to understand the verses themselves. So a good Bible dictionary. And then a Bible encyclopedia. Now there would be some overlap between the dictionary and the encyclopedia. But if you're real serious about Bible study, the Bible encyclopedia would be a good addition to have. And then when you read terms and places and people and things, you go there and it explains what these places and things are. And it will help you in your Bible study. But most people, talking to them about this, most people say, Brother Carl, the hardest part for me is finding the right time to do it. Because I know we're all busy. I know that. But you can set a time. You may have to vary it. You can't always meet at 2 o'clock on Monday. But if you have a time, it will help you in your Bible study. But there's one other way to do it. There is no better way than this. And that is, go to Sunday school. That's the best way. Because You'll study the lesson on Sunday, but you have to prepare for it, so it means you're going to study it during the week. It is a good thing to go to Sunday school. I teach Sunday school in our church. I've taught this class for over 23 years, and it's a great class. And uh, we're having our Christmas banquet Friday night, and uh, Anne Frank told me we got 64 people signed up to be there. They're all my class members. So we have a great time studying the scriptures. Go to Sunday school. That's a great place. It's a great place. There are also other Bible study offerings out there. I know Carol tells me about one that she goes to. I think it's weekly, isn't it? A Bible study that's planned and coordinated and 
and uh, she seems to enjoy it from all she tells me. Bible study, Bible study. There is no substitute for it. Okay, now let's get to our study on faith and works. I hope you have your pens and your paper handy and ready to take some notes. There is no question but that faith is the beginning place for the Christian journey. No other faith. Also, here is the beginning of the salvation experience. We are saved by grace through what? Faith. We believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and we're saved. Don't ever let anybody tell you anything different to that. The Bible is very clear. Salvation is by grace through faith. And every person who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ is saved. But there's one more sentence that has to be added to that. Any person in the world who will believe can be saved and will be saved. The Lord has not selected some to be saved and some to be lost. Don't you ever let anybody tell you that. God has not chosen some to be his children and some to go to hell. Jesus died for the whole world. And the Bible says over and over and over, whosoever, whosoever, whosoever. And aren't you glad it does? Because that means you and I were included. Whosoever, whosoever. But it doesn't say whosoever works enough or whosoever has enough money to buy it. You can't earn it and you can't buy it. Salvation is a gift. And it is through Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ alone. Simon Peter said on the day of Pentecost, there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It is Jesus or else. He is the Savior. He is the only Savior. And God has not chosen some to be saved and some to be lost. The Bible says God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You will hear the term and read the term Calvinism. Maybe you've read that already and you've wondered what is that all about. It is being talked about a lot nowadays. And a lot of people are confused about it. The true Calvinists will say, only those that God chooses will be saved. I part company with them. God has chosen to save any person, anywhere, anytime, who will come to the Lord in repentance and faith. Amen. That's it. And there is no one so bad that he doesn't need, that he can't be saved, and there's nobody so good that he doesn't need to be. But any person in the world who will repent of his sin and place his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is saved and he's going to go to heaven. But if he doesn't do that, he's going to hell. That's it. That's it. 
In our study last Wednesday night and tonight, we're talking about faith and works. But I spent the first half of last Wednesday night explaining to all of us that faith comes first. You can't be saved without believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't be. You can't be. But any person who will believe will be. You got that, Connie? That's it. That's God's word. That's the truth. And you can take it to the bank. Or better still, take it to heaven. So what I have to do is examine my heart. Have I truly believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and trusted him as my Savior? And the best I know in my heart, I've done that. And I hope you said the same thing. My youngest brother, whose name was Edward, had cancer, and we knew that his days were limited. I talked with him about his relationship to the Lord, and just a few days before he died, I went down to see him again and talk with him again. And I explained to him over and over again that any person, including him, who would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ would be saved and go to heaven. And because I loved my brother, I kept pressing him. And I remember on that last visit, the thing he said to me, he said, Carl, I've done that, and I don't know anything else to do. And I said, that's what I want to hear. You've done that. I'll see you just inside the gate. Okay. I had another brother, half-brother, who throughout his life said, I just can't believe. I don't see how anybody can believe. And he stood off from the rest of us. And he said, I just don't see it. I don't understand it. And we try our best to show it in the scriptures. And he too developed cancer. But I'm happy to tell you that when he was 80 years old, my brother Bob finally saw the light and prayed to receive Jesus. And he and Hallie came to visit us several times there in Brentwood. And on their last visit before he died, he said, we were out somewhere in the car, just the two of us, and he said, Carl, turn the motor off. I want to ask you a question. After he became a Christian, he became so active. They called on him to read the scripture in his little church, and he just got so active, and he couldn't get enough of it. So on that visit, when he told me to turn the motor off, he said, somewhere before I die or you die, would you please explain to me why I waited so long to give my life to the Lord? Well, I didn't say it to him, but I could have because you were stubborn. 
Well, I thank God that he got saved. And when he died out in Burbank, California, Hallie asked me to come out and do his service. And his pastor was willing for me to do it. And I told that story in his funeral. And one man came up to me afterwards and he said, now this is your brother. I said, yes, sir. And you say that he got saved. I said, yes, sir. He said, that's the best news I've ever heard because I loved your brother. But for all the years, he wouldn't have anything to do with the church or the Bible or anything else. I said, that's right. But he got saved. And I'll see him up there. Any person who will repent and trust the Lord Jesus Christ can be saved and will be saved. And there are no exclusions. But it is by faith and not by works. You got that? You can't earn it. If you could obtain salvation by working, doing good things, how would you ever know when you've done enough? Maybe you failed by one thing you didn't do. No, salvation is in Jesus Christ who paid for our sins on the cross. And if we believe and trust in him, we're forgiven and saved. Thank God. So where does works come in? I'm glad you asked. That's a good question. The Bible has a lot to say about that. So I want us to complete our study tonight. Would you turn with me to the book of Titus, please? Just before the book of Hebrews, the book of Titus. Chapter two, uh, chapter three, and verse five. We looked at this briefly last Wednesday night. Not by verse five, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And there it is. Not by works of righteousness, which we've done, but by the mercy of God through Jesus Christ. But now the Bible says we ought to have the kind of faith that works. Not to get saved, but because you have been saved. Let's go now to the book of James, please, to the passage that you're very familiar with. James chapter 2. Let's begin at verse 17. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. So James said, 
If your faith in the Lord is real faith, it will prove itself in the life that you live. And the life that you live will be a life of good works. But now keep this always in your mind when you're thinking about these things. The good works of a Christian are for two purposes. As an example to the lost, hoping they will see Jesus in your life. And secondly, to glorify God. So let's go back now to Matthew chapter 6. Well, first of all, chapter 5. And look at verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now, there it is, all wrapped up in one verse. We do good things. We serve God. We serve others. We serve the church. We do good things, not to earn salvation, but because the Lord has saved us, and we have a new life in Jesus Christ. And so Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. And hopefully they will see in your good works evidence of the Lord's presence in your life. And they want to be a Christian because of what they've seen in you. But secondly, do it to glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now I want to point you to an illustration Jesus gave. Turn to the sixth chapter of Matthew. Look at verse 1. Take heed, that is, beware, that you do not your alms or your good works before men to be seen of them, isn't that what he just said we ought to do? Let your light so shine before men that they may see. No. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see what? Your good works. The Pharisees did what they did that men might see them. And there's a difference. Jesus said, don't be like the Pharisees who do their good deeds before men that men may see them. Jesus said, do your good deeds before men that they may see your good deeds. Not you, but your deeds. So look at chapter 6 now. Look at verse 5. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets. Why on the corner? Why not in the middle of the block? Well, in the middle of the block, they would only be seen two ways. If they stood on the corner, they could be seen four ways. that they may be seen of men. 
Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. They are doing the things they do that men may see them. And when men see them, that's their reward. That's what they asked for. That's what they got. But you, my disciple, let your light so shine before men that they may see not you, but your good works. And glorify your Father, which is in heaven. You see the difference? We don't do our good works to earn salvation. And we do not do our good works to be seen of men. We do our good works. We serve the Lord. We live for the Lord. We work for the Lord. We help other people. We do our good works. That when people see not us but the good works, they may be attracted to Jesus through what they see in our lives. So good works have a very important place in the life of a Christian. For it is through those good works that we show that our faith is real And we live an example before others that may cause them to want to be a Christian. So Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Why do people go to church, live a good life, pray, read the Bible, give a tithe of their income, help other people? Why do people do that? Is it because some people are just turned that way? No. Nobody's just turned that way. People do that because the Lord has changed them, given them a new life. And that new life expresses itself in these things that we do. Not to earn our salvation but to serve the Lord. Now there's one other thought I want to give you. Turn to Philippians chapter 2. You've got to see this as we conclude our study. Look at verse 12. Therefore, now don't read over the therefores until you see what they're there for. Okay? Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in our absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That's a Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Work out your salvation. Now, don't make Paul say something there he didn't say. He didn't say work for your salvation. He said work out your salvation. So what the Lord has worked in through Jesus, we work out through our lives. Lived for the Lord. 
But don't stop there. Look at the next verse. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. That's a wonderful verse. When God saves us through Jesus, he begins a new work in our lives. And this verse says, it is God that worketh in you. So ever since you accepted Jesus, God has been working in your life. And he works in our lives through our daily experiences, through the events of life through the sorrows and the sadness, through the joys and the gladness, through everything, God works in our lives. And how does he do that? I'm glad you asked. That's another good question. He does that through the presence of the Holy Spirit in our heart. And the Holy Spirit came into your heart when you trusted Jesus. He's been there ever since. And he's there to guide you, lead you, teach you, help you, minister to you, to work in your life. And every day you live, God has been doing something in your life. And that isn't going to stop. He'll be working in your life until the day you meet him. And that is a wonderful assurance to know that as a Christian, we are not living and doing these wonderful things in our own strength, but in the strength of the Holy Spirit as he works in us. Day by day. And what does the Holy Spirit use to work in our lives? That's a good question. And this is the answer. He uses the word of God to teach the child of God how to do the will of God. And you should write that down. The Holy Spirit teaches the child of God the word of God that he might be able to do the will of God. It is so wonderful to be a Christian. I wouldn't trade it for anything else. Have I failed? Yes. Have you failed? Yes. And the likelihood is we'll fail again. But he won't. And the salvation that we have received in Christ is the complete salvation not partially, complete. And as we walk with him and live for him and serve him, the Holy Spirit is working, 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 making us more and more like Jesus. And our lives are fruitful for him. I thank you for the comments you gave me last Wednesday night after the first lesson on faith and works. I hope it's been helpful to you, these two sessions that we've had. I don't 
have any idea that you were ever confused about that. No, I don't think that. That's not why I did the study. But I do think we all need to fully understand that faith and works go together. I'm glad when the Lord brought the plan of salvation, he put it on the same basis for everybody. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. That's what he said. Now, what we do with our Christian lives is up to us. And those are called good works. Good works. Now, if you have, a, have to miss a Wednesday night between now and, I, I used to say Christmas, but I better not say that. If you have to miss a Wednesday night, don't miss next Wednesday night, okay? We're going to study something that will be so helpful to us from the book of Peter next Wednesday. <laughs>